We're talking sleep today, how to get better sleep, how to feel better about your sleep, how to perform better, how to wake up refreshed. And we've got a real expert. Pat Byrne is joining us. He's been a consultant to the Seattle Seahawks, the Seattle Mariners, Seattle Sounders. He has a long experience in helping people, including professional athletes or college athletes at the highest level sleep better and perform better. So I wanted to ask him in this time of so many of us are having sleep difficulties, what we can learn um, about sleep and how we can sleep better. And we've got some time to talk about it. I've got a lot of questions, some of them for myself, I, I have to say. And the first thing I want to say up front is that we are not giving medical advice to particular people about particular things. So if you do have a sleep concern, talk to your doctor doctor about it. But having said that, hopefully we, we can give you some good, useful in, in information and maybe I can get a few of my questions answered. So Pat, thanks very much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. And could you tell us a little bit how you got into this world of, of sleep research and sleep performance and athletic performance? How did you get started? And Thanks. It's a great question. I think I think everyone in our age is uh, at a pretty varied career um, <laughs> as, as we go along. So um, I, I, well, I, I'll date myself, but I graduated from uh, Western Washington University in Bellingham in 1979. Great school. Yeah, a great school. I love Bellingham. And um, then I moved back to uh, Vancouver, Canada, where I'm from. And I started work in occupational health and safety, and I did that for 20 years. And uh, with the government agency there, WorkSafe BC, which is like OSHA and NIOSH in the States. And, uh, you know, one day I had a um, young nephew who was 22 years old, a very good basketball player here. In fact, he played against Steve Nash in high school. Um, mm. And, uh, uh, you know, he started his new job in the forestry industry. Uh, worked really long hours, driving home one Friday night, drove his car off a cliff, fell asleep, drove his car off mm. a cliff, died. And it really got me thinking about you know, how is that, how, how is it possible that people like, what's causing this? People falling asleep and driving home from work and dying like that? It just in the world of occupational health and safety at that time, I mean, and this is globally, it wasn't on anybody's radar. People weren't actually thinking about that. You know, I called up colleagues that I knew from literally around the world and people were going, what are you talking about? Um, so I, I, it was a long journey for me to try to learn uh, what was going on in this field. And so I spent a lot of time with um, some friends that I had made in the States, uh, particularly with uh, in the U.S. military, a Pentagon medical officer, folks at uh, Fort Detrick, um, uh, um, uh, Fort Bragg and the uh, Special Ops Command and others. And they really pointed me in the right direction about who was doing research in this area. And so I literally spent years um, on my own, my own time trying to, to learn what mostly the military was doing around this because they were really the lead agency and uh, lead funder of a sort of business. Um, and then I, when I eventually left the government, I started a consulting business teaching about sleep and fatigue to big industry, mining companies and railroads and airlines and that sort of business. And then one day, the uh, uh, the Vancouver Canucks, which are you know, mm. across town from me, came to me and said, you know, we got all these travel issues with our players. Can you help us? Uh, of course, I'm a big fan. I was a big fan of them. Um, mm -hmm. um, and also happy to hear the Kraken are coming to Seattle. That'll yeah, be, yeah. That'll be, that'll be fun. Finally going to have our own team. I uh, know. That'll be exciting. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and they're going to have the same issues that the Canucks came to me with, which is, you know, we virtually all our travel is from West Coast to East Coast. Our players aren't sleeping well. We know it's affecting their performance during games. So, you know, can you help us with this? And I said, well, you know what? I've got some technology here that the Air Force uses uh, for their, uh, you know, fighter bombers and that, that sort of business. And and uh, let's see what we can do. So we started on a journey with them. It was seven years where we tracked players sleep and we looked at sleep and fatigue issues. And, and uh, so that kind of mushroomed um, into this whole business for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I ended up working, you know, literally in China, Australia, Malaysia, all over Europe, all over North America, worked in all of the professional leagues, you know, the National Football League, the NBA, <laughs> Major League Baseball, NHL, soccer, um, and, and they're all great people. And, and what I really learned is that sleep is really universal. 
So it doesn't matter what you do for a living, whether you're an airline pilot or a you know a famous tennis player or you know you know Russell Wilson, or whoever yeah. you are, you know everybody has has their own sleep issues, and a lot of the solutions are are pretty much the same. Yeah, I think when you mentioned someone falling asleep at the wheel, and I, you know, and I'm very sorry to hear that story, but it really points out the importance of sleep and and the consequences of of being sleepy of not not getting enough sleep um one of the things that you talk about in, in in your in your book which is an excellent book it's called inconvenient sleep why teams win and lose and i think we, we also can apply it to why people win and lose as well in 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 the broader sense but but you talk a lot about circadian rhythms and that's what a lot of the sports teams are are dealing with and and athletes you know who golfers tennis players you know who travel on their own they're traveling across time zones and changing up you know what time they get up and what time they go to bed and they can't go to bed when they want to um and and i think a lot of our arp members deal with some of that as well when they travel or they just have a hard time maintaining a regular sleep schedule. What what did you find in in your long experience um, uh, about how important that is and, and what we can do to, uh, to help ourselves? Right. So one of the things that I learned is that we toss around this term circadian rhythm all the time, and people kind of like. What is that? <laughs> so there's really kind of two processes that are going on in our brain. And don't forget that sleep is, is, is a critical brain function. It's, it's what's going on up here. And so there are two processes. One is just sleep. Okay. And so when we sleep, um, we're regenerating our brain. There's a lot of different things going on. We can talk about that in a minute. But on the circadian side, um, basically there's a master clock in our brain. That, that triggers, um, you know, when we sleep and when we eat and all our hormone productions. It's, it's like the CPU of our, our, of our, our body. Right? And it mm-hmm. regulates everything based on a clock. And the clock is set by sunlight. So when we're exposed to light, the light goes through our eyes into that central part of our brain and tells it's dark or light out. And when it's dark out, your brain says, go to sleep. Mm-hmm. And so it's on its particular clock and your body is really slow to change that clock. So when we're on the West Coast here and we travel quickly to the East Coast at you know, six hours, five, six hours, you're on the East Coast. Um, your clock doesn't change, but the light dark cycle outside changes. So you get there, it's already dark, but your, your internal clock is saying, you know what, it's really only four in the afternoon here. I don't feel like sleeping. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that disconnect between the outside dark light cycles and what your clock is saying internally um, is what disrupts everything. And so that disrupts your, you know, your, your sleep patterns. It disrupts your, you know, your digestion, your, you know, body temperature, your reaction time. And so it's very difficult. The, the research around circadian rhythms is still pretty new. It's a whole field called chronobiology, if you want to go. Okay. Right. Um, um, and, and it's still relatively new, much like, much like it's actually a bit older than sleep research, but it's, it's very new. And, and virtually every living thing on our planet has, has uh, an internal clock. Mm. That's mostly regulated by light. And if you look at flowers, for example, when they get light out, they, they blossom, they come out, right? And when it's dark, they fold back in. So everything's regulated by, uh, by this clock. And so that that and so that's a real challenge. And the problem is the research has shown that you can't actually change your circadian clock. People try all these different tricks. You can't do that. All it, it's time. And it takes a while, only because this con- this connection between the light in your eye that goes to your brain is a really slow uh, little funnel, and it just takes its sweet time <laughs> getting to, to to get you to to uh, to change your circadian rhythm. And so, a lot of the research, particularly around sports, are now saying, you know what? There's virtually nothing you can do about it. There's like all of these tips that are out there. Scientifically, they're not proven. Um, and so the best thing you can do is try to plan ahead for it. So um, we've had a lot of hockey teams and other teams that will say, for example, fly from here to Europe for a game. And so what I say to them is, look, um, you need to think about what time you land there. So if you're going to land at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, think about your flight as your night sleep. 
So try to plan a few days ahead so that you can get good night sleep. So it's a matter of just trying to start that process of changing over earlier than you would normally do that. But you know, it's a pretty uh, circadian rhythm is a pretty stubborn. Hmm. Hmm. So I know there's a lot of people and, you know, I, I would ask you this up front. Do you think there are changes in sleep as people get older? Because, I mean, I talk to a lot of people who spontaneously bring up, you know, I'm having a hard time sleeping um, or, you know, I'm waking up in the middle of the night or I'm waking up too early. Um, do, you th do you think that's a, a, a real phenomenon? Oh, absolutely. Hmm. Glad to hear that, actually. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's... Um... It's interesting. I mean, as as we age, and, and I'd like to be able to turn the clock back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not going to let me do that. Um, as we age, you know, our hair gets gray. Um, uh -huh. Our bodies start to change, right? And and it's the same with what's called our sleep architecture. So all of the sleep stages that we go through and how that's designed. And what happens is that starts to break down a bit. Mm -hmm. And so even though you still, your body and your brain needs seven, eight hours of sleep, you're not getting it in one block. Mm -hmm. So we tend to, to we tend to wake up, and I mean I do that a lot, and still wake up four or five in the afternoon. Um, and there are a number of um, reasons for that, but it, I assume you're no, even you're normally a good sleeper. Mm -hmm. But as you age, it starts to break up like that. Uh, one of the ways to kind of deal with it is just literally napping. Mm. Because napping is sleep and you try to make up for it. I know my grandfather used to do that all the time. He'd say, oh, I get by with four or five hours of sleep at night. But he mm. never encoded the two hours napping in his rocker in the afternoon. So, <laughs> so actually, napping is something that you recommend? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, napping is, but napping is a bit like caffeine. You know, you have to do it strategically. So mm -hmm. that if you typically go to bed, say, at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, you don't want to be napping at 6 or 7 at night oh, okay. because then your brain's not going to want to put you to sleep. Right? You kind of throw that, throw that bit off. But th there's another aspect to why I think people generally don't sleep well, and, um, and this carries on as we age as well. And it's important to remember that poor sleep is not a disease. Okay. Poor sleep is a symptom. Mm -hmm. um, and the analogy I use to, for people is that, you know, if your arm hurts, that's a symptom. You go to your doctor and they diagnose what the problem is. You know, is it, you know, is it a broken bone? Is it a stretched muscle? You know, do you have cancer? You know, what's going on? They try to figure out, you know, that, that, you know what, what's causing that symptom. Okay. And poor sleep is very much the same way. So there are many, many causes of poor sleep. So there are, are biological sleep disorders, things like sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, or like 90 plus different biological sleep disorders. And a fair bit of the population have them, and many of them are undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. People will go through, you know, I just can't sleep, can't sleep. You know what, if it's chronic, go, literally, go see your doctor. Many of these things are treatable. Right, get tested, get into a sleep lab where they do polysomnography. They, you know, put electrodes on your brain and uh, put a little cap on, and and uh, and they can detect, you know, why you're not sleeping well. It's, I think that's pretty important to do that. Um, mental health issues, you know, things like particularly where first responders have PTSD, but even um, you know depression and all of the other. Um, we know what we say, and 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 even with athletes, you know, mental health issues are is is big. Yeah. And so the sleep and mental health are really sort of two sides of the same coin. And there's some pretty good research that shows people who are chronically poor sleepers, that can lead to mental health issues. And sometimes people with um, chronic mental health issues can lead to sleep issues. And so what they're starting to pick up now are people who have chronic sleep issues are starting to screen them for mental health issues as well. But there's also things like organic diseases, you know, injuries, diabetes, and other things that affect your sleep. Um, you know, your lifestyle affects your sleep. Um, the, sometimes the food you eat affects your sleep. Um, and so there's a, a, you know, your sleep environment. Um, it's, and so there's a wide variety of things that can actually um, affect your sleep and, and cause poor sleep. And so what we do with athletes is say, look, you know, if you're not sleeping well, let's figure out why. And that's the challenge because sleep is such a new science 
um, that they're just trying to figure out ways now to figure uh, to figure out all the different ways that you may may not be sleeping well. People just assume it's their lifestyle issue or something that's going on. You know, I stayed up late. I did something. But you know what? There may be something biological going on, and you need to get that checked out. Mm. Yeah, I think that's an issue now, especially because at the time that we're doing this um, conversation, we're, we're in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. And a lot of people are, I think, well, ARP knows that a lot of our, our members are struggling with mental health issues, perhaps that they didn't have beforehand, but just because of the social isolation or the inability to be with their loved ones or to go outside. Um, and I think I hear you saying that these may exacerbate sleep issues. Is is there, and it also seems like a, a, a chicken and egg thing. If you, if your mental health is worse because you're not sleeping, and your sleep is worse because your 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 mental health has maybe taken hopefully a temporary dive, um, is there anything that people can can do to to improve that cycle? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's difficult. I it, it, it's, I think it's diff, difficult for people to do by themselves, and mm. so I certainly encourage people to talk to mental health experts. Uh, around those issues and help them and and um, you know I think mental health issue um, experts are uh, beginning to understand the significance of sleep um, in terms of helping people overcome um, mental health issues sleep is you know getting people to to get good sleep um, can actually help them you know, overcome mental health issues and so it's 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 not it's not simple um, one of the things that we we encourage a lot with athletes, if you understand the internal clock we talk about and the sunlight going through your eye, and, you know, and and uh, getting into our internal clock, is that's really helpful in terms of how you set up your bedroom to sleep. And a lot of the, you know, women and men I work with uh, don't understand that if you, your bedroom needs to be completely dark. In order to get good sleep, and by completely dark, I mean that if you hold your hand a foot away from your face, you shouldn't be able to see your hand. Okay, I think I think that's hard for for some people to do. Do you have any thoughts on eye shades or blackout curtains or black? Yeah, um, it it depends where you live, and and there are a number of issues around that. It, and it literally took me years to find really good blackout blinds that'll fit over my existing blinds that we can take. And I found some at local store in Vancouver for like 35 bucks. It was, oh. it was there were, um, yeah, it was, it was good. And there's, it's literally so dark um, that I, you, to get up to go to the bathroom, which I do in the night, like most people, yeah. um, I actually have my phone on the floor by my bed. So I just reach down and pick my phone up and use it as a flashlight to get to the, to get to the bathroom. Oh, well, that's a good idea. Cause I think a lot of people have, have, have night lights or something, but, but then then your room isn't dark, right? Right. I mean, isn't that the yeah, that's part of the problem, right? Exactly. And even with your eyes closed, the light can go through your eyelids. Oh. So we encourage people to have obviously a comfortable bedroom, but darkness is and being able to manage light is a very critical factor in getting good sleep. And what about the issue of waking up in the middle of the night? I I have a father-in-law who woke up at 3 a.m. and could not get back to sleep. And I, I sometimes wake up like an hour and a half after I've gone to sleep, which doesn't seem like enough sleep, but uh, I, I go back to sleep. But but it's just, I'm going, that doesn't seem right. Um, are all those things kind of normal or are any of them cause for concern or can be helped? Right, so waking up in the night is normal. In fact, we often wake up five, six, eight times a night normally. Oh. Wow. Uh, but typically, we wake up, and we can tell this from the, when you studies on brain waves because you can see the, the brain wave patterns. But you wake up, and you just barely wake up, and you fall back asleep again. And so you often, most of the time, you don't actually remember it. But when you look at the brain waves of these people, you can actually tell that they wake up. Mm. The problem is, as we get older, we wake up and our eyes go, <laughs> right? And then, oh, I'm yeah. in the bathroom and I turn the lights on. And um, yeah, and so um, that's part of the whole sort of sleep architecture breaking down within our system, which is, as I said, it's not, it, it, it's, it's a normal part of aging. Mm -hmm. Um and, and, you know, one of the ways, of course, is to have a, a dark room and to use relaxation and to um, 
obviously have a co comfortable, cool bedroom, and and uh, uh, and to use napping, which is okay as well. Right. So, so don't, don't don't fret about it. I mean, okay. the, the problem comes if it's really chronic and it's every night and you and and napping isn't helping these things aren't helping that's the time you really need to go and see your doctor um and we see that a lot with professional athletes that the night before or a couple of nights before a big game or any game that they're rolling around and they're sleeping yeah. and, and and they're nervous and so what we say to them is like don't worry about it we know that sleep affects reaction time but if you are if you are constantly a good sleeper or you're normally a good sleeper, then, you know, one or two nights of bad sleep is not going to hurt you that much. Yeah. Speaking of worrying about it, um, you you have a lot of great info in in the book about all the Apple Watch, Fitbit um, type of things that you can wear to track your sleep and the apps that will tell you how much REM sleep you're getting or how much deep sleep you're getting. Um, but you have some real thoughts on those um, sort of devices I think might might surprise people. They surprise me. So could you tell us what you think about the consumer devices that are out there now? Sure, absolutely. And and, and with full disclosure first, I, I created and founded a company in uh, 2007 um, that created the very first FDA approved sleep and fatigue watch so i know about the. i've retired from them years ago but okay. I, I know about the technology and i know how it's built and designed and what it can and can't do so what i tell people about sleep watches and they're basically really the, all the same in some ways um they're um if you have an iphone or any of these um, smartphones they have what's called accelerometers in them so you turn them one way and the screen changes right mm -hmm. it's, it's a little accelerometer and that's all it's in these watches are accelerometers it can tell when you're moving and so what it does the theory is that if you're if your wrist is moving you're awake and if your wrist is not moving you're asleep so that's the kind of big the big picture side of that there's a lot of sort of messy mathematical algorithms that go into refining that but that that's that's the the big thing but the way i view sleep watches is much like your bathroom scale at home like so everybody probably got a bathroom scale and they stand on it once in a while mm -hmm. um and it'll tell you pretty much and it's it's fairly accurate usually within a couple of degrees of what you know you get at your doctor's office um but what it, it doesn't it, it will tell you one thing your weight okay it doesn't tell you whether that's normal or abnormal right and it doesn't tell you if you're trying to lose weight or gain weight it doesn't tell you how to do that either right it's just a number so you have to individualize it to that person. And the problem with sleep watches is they're trying to market them as something more than they really are. They're bathroom scales. Okay. <laughs> and they don't help you sleep any more than a bathroom scale is going to help you lose weight. And so there's a lot more attached to that than just, just a number. So they basically tell you whether you're moving around and 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 then assuming that you're that you're awake but it can't tell what stage of sleep you're in no right so let's back up a little bit talk about okay. the, the sleep stages okay so our, our brains have you know billions of brain cells and neurons in them and they communicate with each other that's how we think and when they do that they give off um electrical low level electrical signals okay and so when we talk about somebody that's quote, brain dead, that means the brain's not giving off electrical signals anymore, the brain cells aren't talking to each other, and they're effectively dead. So our brains are constantly giving off these low-level electrical signals. What they've discovered over the years is that the signals are completely different from when you're awake than from when you're asleep. Mm -hmm. So they can tell from your brain waves when you're sleeping, and so you go through um, a, sort of a... a I, I, you go into a, a, a deeper and deeper and deeper sleep, right? And then you you, it's a, you get into a really deep sleep. Then you come back up right up to the top again. And then you go through what's called REM or REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And that's a period of time where you dream. Right. And so those are called, called sleep cycles. You go through usually five of those in one night. And um, REM sleep is kind of interesting because it's, the brain waves on REM sleep look exactly like uh, sleep waves when you're awake. 
Really? Yeah, they're, they're identical. And when that was discovered in the early 1950s um, at the University of Chicago, they, um, and, and you'll read about this in the book's fascinating story, I think, about Eugene Azarinsky. Oh, right. Yeah. And, and the work that he did is a fascinating story, an uh, interesting man. From yeah, he, yeah, he actually, actually spent some time in Seattle. Right. Yes, and yes, yes. Right. yes. Oh. came to University of Washington after he finished work there um, right. on, on sleep. And and so what and so what happens when we're dreaming is our, our body freezes. Right? You can't move when you're when you're dreaming. So we go through these sleep stages. So what's happened if the, with the sleep watch technology is they've tried to tell people, look, um, we can actually tell what sleep stage you're in. When, when not just you know how long you slept or when you're sleeping, but we can actually tell you what sleep stage you're in. Hmm. Uh, you can't actually do that. Okay. Um, you can't measure brain. Well, you know, I, I've, I work for a professor at Stanford. He goes, you know, sleep is in the brain. It's not on your wrist, right? Right. Okay. Right. And so it 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 makes it infers certain sleep stages. Okay. So they says, well, you know, because these sleep stages last ninety minutes. So halfway through it is, you know, we're, you're going to be in a deep sleep. So, you know, when we put your, your sleep watch on you halfway through, when we think you're asleep, we're going to say you're in this deep sleep. Okay. Right? So they, they infer the stages. But even if even if they could measure, uh, your, you, you know, um, the sleep stages, it's completely useless information to most people. You okay. know, what, what are you going to do with it? Well, well, I sit there and obsess over whether I've gotten proper right. sleep for now, I guess. Nobody's going to go to sleep at night and go, yeah, I think I'm going to get more REM sleep tonight. It's yeah, like, I'm trying, though. That's the well, thing. You, you, you can't because it's not something you can control. So it's it's, just, it's a marketing marketing thing that it is completely useless information. In fact, I would argue that it actually makes people more anxious about their sleep than they need to be. So then I guess I guess I would ask you, what what do the watches that are used in the research studies that you you talk about in, in the book, and there's there's quite a few of them that are fascinating. Are those measuring something else then, or no? They're they're largely measuring the same thing, but um, what the what we call medical there's medical grade and consumer grade technology. Right, exactly. That's so, what you're you know I, I call real real stuff in Cracker Jack toys, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, okay. that's probably a bit disingenuous. No, but, no, no. I think that's fair, but I'd like to hear what what sure. what makes the real stuff real. Sure. Sure. The difference is that it's validation. So the the real trick is not just the the hardware that goes into building the watches, but the software that goes into converting all of these all this movement business into sleep. Okay. So pe the people have you know created there's there's some off the shelf um, algorithms. There's some ones that the company's created. We used a modified one at the company I had. Um, and but what you need to do is to put large groups of people into a sleep lab overnight, where they're both wearing a watch and getting all their brain waves checked at the same time. Oh, okay. So when they're checking their brain waves, they know pretty precisely when they're awake and when they're asleep. And so what you do is just compare the, compare the data from your brain on your wrist and say, oh, this is you know sixty percent, eighty percent, one hundred percent accurate in terms of okay. figuring out when you're asleep and when you're awake. So the medical grade actographs of ones that have gone through testing, right, and they'll have an FDA clearance. Okay. Where the consumer grade are largely unregulated, and most of them have not gone through the kinds of uh, rigorous testing that need to go through to to show that it's you know can be used for research. So actually, there's no real value to a consumer getting a medical grade watch by themselves because you need the validation up front and the yeah. monitoring. Well, validated, they're, they're just incredibly more expensive. Oh, oh, really? Okay. Okay. Um, um, and, 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 and you can, um, the consumer ones are fine, as long as you know what to do with the data. Mm -hmm. You know, even if they're not, you know, 95% accurate, even if they're 85% accurate, it gives you an ID. It's like having a bathroom scale at home that's not exactly what's in your doctor's office. Mm -hmm. It gives you a pretty good idea within a few pounds where you are, but it's what you do with the information that matters. Yeah, unfortunately, one of my doctor's offices is always off. It makes me 
heavier than I think yeah. I am. But you know, we must go to the same doctor. <laughs> so so that's, that's not right. Here, I'll take some more stuff out of my pockets. Um, but you know, it sort of occurs to me that we should pr probably talk about the stages of sleep. And, and when we started talking about REM sleep and and why we need different stages, but but perhaps for those who who haven't been in the sleep world, I've done a sleep study myself for sleep apnea, so I know a little bit about it. But I think I think for me and 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 also people who who don't really know what the stages of sleep are, could, could, could you sort of run through them? Sure. Yeah. So um, so basically, when, you know, sleep is not an on-off switch. So you're not awake, you're not asleep, right? So it's this whole progression of uh, slowing down of your brain and your brain waves as you're f slowly falling asleep. Um, but they will reach a point where they can tell from your brain waves that you're asleep. And you can usually tell within a couple of minutes of when that is. And as your brain waves change, you go from what's called stage one, which is really kind of a drowsy sleep, mm -hmm. into a deeper and deeper sleep. And the, the brain waves get really as you get into a deeper sleep, they get longer and wider. That's called deep sleep, a deep, a, a deep cycle sleep, right? And then it's it's it shifts and it goes back up into um, uh, you know stage three, stage two, up right into rapid eye movement sleep, which is at at the top. Um, what's interesting is that not all sleep stages are the same. So even though they're typically ninety minutes long each. So you go through that whole thing in 90 minutes, and then it repeats itself. The, uh, the amount of REM sleep you get changes. So most of the REM sleep you get is actually at the back end of your sleep, not at the front end of your sleep. Mm. So that's why a lot of times we'll remember our dreams when we wake up, because a lot of our sleep is at the back end of our sleep, usually between sort of, you know, the five and a half, six to eight hour period of time. So if you're not... Uh, if, if you're you know, chronically sleeping five, six hours, you're not getting the amount of REM sleep that you need. Okay. And, the, and, and, and all this happens in a 90-minute cycle yeah, for, yeah. for, Typically for 90 most minutes. everybody? Yeah, typical 90-minute cycle to go okay. through those sleep stages. Um, and so people – and what's called, it's interesting if you ever see anybody with rapid eye movement, if you have a spouse in bed and they're asleep, watch their eyes. Because even with their eyes closed, you can see their eyelids <laughs> like this. Okay. That's you can tell they're in rapid eye movement sleep. And animals do the same thing. You can see. Oh, yeah. It. Okay. yeah. And 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 it, you know, I mean, virtually every living organism sleeps to a certain extent or not, and have has different ways of coping with it. Um, mm -hmm. Water migratory birds, for example, that fly from South America to the North Pole, um, go con fly continuously. But oh. half their brain is asleep, and the other half is awake and guides them, and it switches off. Um, and it's the same, our brain's very adaptable. If you are forced to stay awake for very long periods of time, your brain, instead of going through the normal cycle, will drop you right into a deep sleep, mm. a slow wave sleep, and keep you there for a long period of time until it gets what it wants out of you. <laughs> and then it'll, it'll get you back into it. So the brain's very adaptive in terms of um, you know, making sure it gets what it wants you know, out of sleep. And one of the interesting analogies I use a lot, particularly with the younger athletes, is I say to them, you know, you know, you guys probably sit at home with your friends and or at least you used to when you're little, sit around and see who can hold their breath the longest. You know, and everybody's like, you know, <laughs> hold their breath. And eventually everybody, you know, starts starts uh, breathing. So what happens is your brain will let you mess with your breathing. Right. It'll let you hold your breath for a period of time. Um, and which is good because a lot of athletes and others use that uh, breath control as, you know, as a, as a good te relaxation technique. But your brain will only let you get so far. After a while, you're, you know, if you drew, you can't, so you can't commit suicide by holding your breath. Mm -hmm. your, brain, your brain will say, sorry, I need oxygen and force you to breathe. Right. So it'll let you play around to a certain extent. Uh, sleep is very much the same way. So you, your brain will let you mess with your sleep. You can stay up all night if you want. You can stay up for maybe a couple nights if you want. Um, you know, but your brain will reach a point where it absolutely needs sleep and will shut your brain down. So whether you're flying a plane or you know, driving a car or you know, watching a, you know, a television show or watching one of his podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you're not falling asleep, but you never know. No, but once it, your brain will say, if your brain needs sleep and you deprive it of it for too long, it will shut down. Hmm. It will put you to sleep. So, so there's no way to really 
permanently harm yourself by staying away? Not really. No, your brain will. F- no, your just, brain will f- the, the way you harm yourself is people think they can fight through their biology by uh, f- uh, driving all night. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, long haul truckers. We've had lots of accidents with airplanes of, you know, people that think that they can fight their biology and just, you know, roll down the window and get some cold air. None of that works. Right. A little bit of coffee for a very short period of time. But your brain eventually will say, I need oxygen or I need sleep and just takes over from you. And and it couldn't care less what you're doing. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that, and that's why it's a danger in industry and and uh, and in general life about people traveling. And that's you know what really shocked me about my nephew, you know, falling asleep, young, healthy, you know, twenty two year old kid doesn't never drank alcohol, didn't drink caffeine, uh, you know, just reached his limit, his brain just shut down. Wow. Yeah, you know, one of the things that our members like to do is travel and travel across time zones and there's all these hacks that you should stay up until your bedtime in in the new time zone or you know you should go work out or you should go right to bed and get some sleep are are there any uh tips from the world of uh professional sports or from you know teams that you've consulted with who travel um do you do you have any advice for sort of being your best as soon as possible when when you've when you've driven cross country or flown to Europe or something. Right. So driving is actually not a problem because you actually get, go through the time zones quite slowly. Okay. It, it's, it's the flying that, that that's the problem because you get across the multiple time zones in a very short period of time and throws off your, your internal clock. So the first thing I would say to people is if you want to be like a pro athlete, get a private jet. That's helpful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, we can do that next time. Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe I think Medicaid covers that. I think. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes. But, but I think the the um, and and the reason I say that is and and I'm not being too facetious is because they can pick when they travel and when they don't travel. Mm. Right. So when I work with teams that have private fly private jets, we can time their 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 travel so that you know if they're going to fly from you know, from Kansas City to Finland, um, you know, we can get them to f- start flying at midnight, sleep all during the flight and get there it's morning. <laughs> yeah. Right. So they, there are things, but when you're flying commercial, like everybody else, um, it's, it's much more difficult because you're at the mercy of the schedules. So there are a couple of things um, I always recommend is when you get to the new times, and it depends how long you're going to be in a new time zone for, obviously, if you're there, overnight and you're going back somewhere else, then I wouldn't worry about it too much. But if you're going to be there for a while, get outside, get as much sunlight as you can, because don't forget sunlight gets into your brain and tells your body that you need to be awake and will keep, keep you awake. Um, But there's also a lot of things you can do before you fly. So literally, you know, take out a piece of paper and say, I'm going to be in Paris at nine o'clock in the morning on this day. And this is my flight. And it's going to be 14 hours from here to here. Um, and, th- and I'm leaving an, in the afternoon. So where am I going to get my sleep so that I can start transforming my whole body into the new time zone? So it does take some preparation ahead of time to do that. It's not always practical. Um, but certainly you can make it worse on planes if you drink too much alcohol because you get dehydrated. So okay. keep hydrated. Uh, try to, I can't sleep on planes to mm. save my life. Um, uh, to be honest, when because I, I travel a lot to Australia. I worked a lot of the teams down there in the mining industry and others. Um, I, and, I, you know, I literally went to Australia – I flew from Vancouver to Sydney to uh, to uh, Brisbane for a three hour meeting and turned around and came back. Uh, which was now back in my stupid days, and I was like twenty two hours there, three hour meeting, twenty two hours back. Um, I literally got went to my doctor and I got uh, prescription sleeping drugs because I knew there were periods of time I needed to sleep. Mm-hmm. And there was no way I could sleep on a plane with the noise and with the, the, the time zone changes, my body wasn't ready to sleep, but I needed to sleep. So, you know, depending on how far you travel, certainly have a discussion with your doctor about whether that's an appropriate thing for you, because um, it can work in, in certain circumstances to get you the sleep you need um, on planes. And I, I just can't sleep on planes. I can't sleep sitting up. So. Oh, really? See, I can, I'm, I'm out of it. So 
a, a, a slide. I can put the seat back, and it's I, not comfortable. Yeah. I always wake up with a neck ache. So. I, you know, I, I I envy people again. My wife as well. I mean, she can sleep. And anywhere, literally, when our kids were small, we'd put them in the back seat of the car and tie them in, you know, buckle them in, and we'd get in the front. And I'm backing out of the driveway, and I look over, and my wife's already asleep. <laughs> Which oh, is that's, that's, that's a good sleep. shows one, how tired she is with small kids, but also how boring I am. So, <laughs> but well, uh, well, um, kind of along those lines, um, you've got a lot of great stories of working with teams and with athletes. Um, is there a story that comes to mind, and you don't have to name any names here, but of somebody who perhaps had really bad sleep habits and was able to improve their uh, on-court or on-field performance by by making some changes? Of, or is, is there a dramatic or, or perhaps humorous story along those lines? Sure. I'm, I'm careful not to mention. Um, yeah, I don't know. He's, 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 he's very professional, a, a very um, um, well-known um, um, high-level professional hockey player. Okay. Um, and so one of the things that we, when we work with professional athletes, is not, we not only talk to them about sleep, because you can talk to people till the blue in the face about sleep, but they have to see how it directly affects their reaction time. So the, the worse your sleep, the worse your reaction time when you're awake. That's actually measurable. Mm. And so one of the things that we've done um, over the years is actually demonstrate to athletes, look, you're sleeping six hours. Here's your reaction time. You try sleeping eight hours and we'll show you how that improves your reaction time. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, it snaps their head around. And so a lot of the, the professional athletes, once they actually see the data, and under, and they're very competitive. I mean, these guys are competitive over every little thing, and they're not just on the sport they're doing, but everything in life. They're very competitive people, and so they're always going. You know, I'm the best sleeper on the team. I'm, I've got the fastest reaction time on the team. So we 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 create that kind of a, a system where it's not just how many sleep hours are you getting, but how is that affecting your reaction time. And it's these are they're subtle differences, but we've known for you know a, a decade of data that we've collected in professional teams that once your reaction time drops so ten percent, so you're at ninety percent level, you lose the vast majority of the games you're playing. Wow! Like you compete against somebody who has a ninety percent reaction time versus somebody that's a hundred percent reaction time, you're gonna get your butt kicked. Sorry, <laughs> that, that, on fast sports, particularly the NBA and NHL, you know the puck goes one hundred miles an hour. You're a goalie. You know you have a, a reduction in reaction time. It, it, it affects a lot of things. It affects your speed. It affects you know, your you know potential for injury. Um, it affects your mood. Um, your you know your uh, how you know how quickly um, you can uh, recover from some of these things, and so uh, you know the, the real the real success for me in working with uh, professional athletes is them actually seeing how their sleep directly affects their reaction time. I mean, you can do this online. You can go to these um, websites, and they're free. Um, and they'll do, you, they click on the button; it'll measure your reaction time. So, if you've got one of these watches, I don't care whether consumers or not. So keep track of your reaction time or keep track of your sleep. And every couple hours, go online and check your reaction time and just graph them. Mm. And you'll actually get to see how your, um, your how your reaction time or your how your sleep affects your reaction time. Wow. The, the, the other thing that actually correlates with performance and reaction time is body temperature. Mm. So okay. if you look at the curve of um, uh, uh, reaction time during the day for humans, it completely correlates with uh, body temperature. So the higher your body temperature, the faster your reaction time. That's actually been known since in literally 1920s. Yeah. Uh, but it hasn't been really introduced into professional sports at that kind of a level until now. Well, you know, I think it's probably a common thing because uh, as you talk about in the book, athletes at a high level tend to be young and people who are younger tend to have later sleep cycles because I've noticed I I used to be a late sleeper and, and I like to stay up late and I, I still sort of do, but I wake up earlier now. Um, but I think you have a lot of younger people who, you know, perhaps they like to party after the games or whatever. And then I, I think it's probably easy to see how they could get the same kind of bad sleep habits or almost more easily than the average person. 
Right. So it's interesting because um, we talked about circadian rhythms early on, and people tend to fall into a couple different categories. They're what they call owls, so mm -hmm. the people that naturally stay up late and, and, and sleep in in the morning. And then there are what are called larks, people that naturally go to bed early and um, get up early. And often that will change a little bit throughout their life, but often people will carry that through throughout their lifetime. That's and so for the vast majority of the population, about twenty five percent are owls, twenty five percent are larks, and fifty percent are kind of in between. Um, but uh, teenagers, adolescents, young adults, up to even you know twenty two, twenty three years old before the brain is fully developed, are naturally owls. Mm -hmm. So they, um, particularly in a lot of young athletes, are this way as well. Is that they naturally stay up late and sleep in in the morning. And so we, I've had a lot of discussions with coaches and management and professional teams saying, look, a lot of these young guys, they're not out partying necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that, that part of it is, has gotten to think a lot better in professional sports. But, but this is part, natural part of their biology. So don't get them up at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning to go to some team meeting you don't need to have till the afternoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's knowledge. And so one of the things that we've done with teams is to say, you know, if you really understand how your players are sleeping, you can actually make smarter decisions about about when you have meetings and when you have practices. Um, and so we we've changed that, and certainly with some of the Seattle teams and others, is they get they once they see what the what called team sleep profile looks like, how all their players, you know, when they sleep and when they get, they go, oh. Why are we getting them up so early? I'm going, yeah, good question. <laughs> um, and that's affected a lot of the discussion, too, um, around school start times for kids. Yeah, that's that's always a big issue. Right. Um, and and the problem with teenagers is that they have, you know, and I, I used to be one, um, is we have to fit into the adult world. Yeah. And, right. And so it's not... Um, e e it's it's not simple because school start times have a lot of different factors that go into them, not just um, based on you know the students' circadian rhythms, but you know often the kids have to be driven to school and the parents need to get to work. I mean, there are a huge number of factors that go into kind of doing that. But I think all the research has really shown now that the longer you can extend the sleep of teenagers, um, you know, in the morning, the the better off they are in terms of their grades. In fact, there was a great study done by the uh, Naval Academy a number of years ago where they did a four-year study where they actually measured the sleep of their cadets over a four-year period and looked at um, – so in the first year, they – and what they do halfway through the academic year is they give them a lot of standardized tests. And so – in the first year, they had uh, six hours of sleep. And so they knew, and that had been going on for quite a few years. I knew what the standardized test scores were then a certain ribbon. Then the next year, they gave them another six years or six hours of sleep every night. And it was the same within that ribbon. Then they had a transition year. And then on the fourth year, they gave them eight hours of sleep. And their standardized test scores went from here to here. Really? Yeah. Wow. It was it was a 12% difference in standardized test scores. So the, the lowest test scores with eight hours of sleep were the same as the highest test scores with six hours of sleep. Gee, that seems like a pretty significant jump. It is, you know, and, and it's really showed up in a lot of other studies as well. And the reason is that what we learn in daytime goes into what's called a short-term memory. Mm -hmm. And when we're sleeping... It takes all of those pieces of paper we've generated during the day and puts them into the permanent file box that we can drag out later for tests, right? So it goes into long-term memory. And if you're not getting the sleep that you need, you're just not generating those long-term memories that you need. And, you know, we certainly have had a lot of discussion with NFL players and particularly who, you know, have to learn 50 new plays a week. Mm -hmm. right? And if they're not getting the sleep they have, they can make one mistake on a Sunday and they might not have a career anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So big consequences for, you know, for professional athletes. I mean, for the rest of us and for students, it makes a big difference in terms of their ability to learn and to, and to take tests. Yeah, I think that's also important for, for, for those of us who are older, who maybe um, as we get older, it's kind of harder to learn sort of a new process or, or, or something. Does, does sleep have a, a, a part in that? Absolutely. Yeah, sleep. I always say nothing good happens from bad sleep. Okay. <laughs> so sleep is 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 one of the most integrated functions in our body. It affects everything we do. 
literally everything we do. It 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 is it, it drives our our CPU, our, our our brain. And so the nano I can't remember if I used this in the book. It was in one of the drafts. It was like taking a screwdriver into your computer, into your hard drive, and turning it around. So don't be surprised if it affects virtually every program you got in your computer. Yeah. Uh, so when you start messing with your sleep and your brain, don't be surprised that it affects virtually everything you do in your life. And that's something that's relatively new to science, right? Because I mean, I think people have always known that sleep is an important part of life. But but a lot of what we know about how it works is is relatively new, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's in, I don't know if it, it's my, my poor attempt at, at humor and the chapter, which is, uh, you know, sleep comes late to the science party. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, I mean, we had, they knew the entire structure of DNA before yeah. research even started, right? And, you know, there were x rays in hospitals before sleep research even started. And so, yes, yeah, certainly virtually everything we know now about um, sleep and how it affects human performance is we've known the last, excuse me, the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And it's ongoing every day. I mean, virtually every day I get my e emails, you know, pinging with a lot of new research coming out. Well, well, good. Well, that's uh, that's encouraging because, you know, it seems like a really important subject um, and, you know, one that concerns a lot of people. And I guess along those lines, what would you suggest someone who's concerned that maybe they're not satisfied with their sleep do? Are there some things that they should try and maybe a point when they should uh, consult a, a sleep medicine doctor? Right. Yeah, I mean, some of that's very sort of individualized as well and depends on whether that's kind of a chronic thing that's been going on for a long period of time or whether that's just something that's happened, you know, and it happens occasionally. Um, the big thing that I, I get concerned about is just diagnosis. You know, thinking about why aren't I sleeping? Is it because I'm anxious about something? Um, is it my lifestyle that I stay up? You know, or, or, you know, is it, you know, do I snore? Is it potentially do I have a sleep disorder? Um, you know, is it, affect, is, is it affecting my life? Right? And if your sleep is affecting your life, go see your doctor. Okay. Uh, affecting your life in terms of like falling asleep during the yeah. day when yeah. when you don't want to. Or... Yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. Your performance, your memory, um, your your mental health issue, any anything. If you think your sleep is affecting your performance uh, or your health, absolutely go see your uh, sleep medicine doctor because um, they can pinpoint what's going on, and if they can do that, um, there's a good chance they can um, have a treatment for it. Great. Well, that's probably a good place for for me to stop the questions. But ex except to ask you, is there anything I haven't asked you or we haven't talked about that you think is important for ARP members to know about? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as 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 we age, I think just to um, and it's hard for me to kind of accept what's going on. Yeah. Uh, um, and and our sleep will be affected, but as I said, you know, if if it's chronic and if it's if it's really affecting your life, then you can see somebody about it, see your doctor about it. Um, but don't fret about it so much. I mean, there's so much stuff in the news about sleep and how important it is, and it is important. But don't make, don't be anxious about it. Like, don't fret about it. Don't check your sleep watch every every night and every other night and wake up and look at it like don't fret about it it's like you know like trying to lose weight but hopping on the bathroom scale every five minutes and you don't okay. need to, don't need, don't fret about it just enjoy the process sorry <laughs> okay well um i i have to recommend the book it's called inconvenient sleep um is is there a reason it's called in, inconvenient is there an inspiration for that? Yeah, it was. It has to do with a lot of um, the athletes I've worked with literally globally where um, because of their busy schedules and travel, sleep becomes an inconvenience to them. Okay. And and also I wanted to mention that you you, you involved your daughter in, in writing this. How, how, how did that come, come about and what was that process like? Oh, yeah. Great story. So, um, yeah. So my daughter, when I started when I started with the Vancouver Canucks in 2008, my daughter was in high school, who and became, she was a volleyball player here and became provincial, much like sort of state champion and MVP, and got a scholarship to go to um, uh, New York, played in the NCAA there, um, and then eventually went to law school at Tulane, where she got a law degree and a sports law specialty, and came back to Canada because she also wanted to get her law degree here or a law license here as well. Um, and so she looked at what I'd been writing in the book and she go, 
<laughs> you need some serious help there. <laughs> is that right? Oh man, that's harsh. Right. I and mean, she's brilliant, right? Okay. And so she goes, let's put our heads together. And so we did. So she had been involved, you know, literally she was one of the first, if not the first woman invited into the Dallas Mavericks dressing room to help them train oh, about sleep. Really? Okay. And so she you know, so she has a lot of experience. She interned with the New Orleans Saints when she was in law school and, mm-hmm. and so she had a lot of experience in sports, both as an athlete, as a you know, as a lawyer and um, you know, and as a, as a consultant. And so, you know, it was great working together with her. Um, you know, we battered our head, beat our heads together a lot, uh, came out of it. Okay. Um, it's great working with, with, with my daughter and she's so brilliant, you know, I mean, I mean it's, uh, I learned, I learned, I learned a lot. Um, so yeah, it was a great experience. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you can tell who wrote what, but um, <laughs> we, we tried to make it flow. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Well, well, I, well, I actually can't say I saw a difference in in writing style. So you you must have blended well. That's 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 a challenging project, but it sounds like it sounds like an enjoyable one. Yeah, it was great. A hard two years. I mean, literally, <laughs> literally, we read close to ten thousand pages of research material for the book. So wow. Well, I have to say it 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 shows in the book. I mean, there's there's a lot of great stories. Um, some of them are very interesting that are not directly related to sleep, but you, you weave them in. Um, right. So, yeah, so one of the things that we tried to do is to let people know and with some of these stories, because we talked about, you know, um, um, lie detectors and a few yeah, that. is about how accepting, how accepting our society is of certain technology that doesn't actually work that well. <laughs> right. And so we wanted to make that same analogy with some of the sports, well, a lot of the sleep stuff that's out there, right? There's a lot of stuff that gets accepted in our society about sleep, but it doesn't all work that well. Um, a lot of these, I mean, a lot of people, I think, in, in you know, our age will go to the drugstore looking for over the counter stuff that says it will help me fall asleep faster. Mm-hmm. Those sleep supplements are not regulated. Right. And so we don't even know if they work or they don't work. Mm. You know, they're just not regulated. And, and so that's what we wanted to kind of create a comparison to people saying, like, this isn't just about sleep. This is about a lot of things in our society that we accept as working that may not work as well as we think they do. So like the practice of taking like melatonin or like magnesium is another one I've heard is supposed to help you sleep. That's that that's not something that you would endorse in general. I don't. Um, it's interesting because melatonin is a hormone, and it's the only hormone in certainly uh, uh, United States and Canada and the Western well in U.S. and Canada that's not regulated. So in Europe, it, you ha- can only get it by uh, medical prescription. That's uh-huh. how that's how they that's how much it, it, they think it affects your body and your brain. But here, you can just go over to the counter and buy anything you want and take it as as much as you want it, it's completely unregulated oh. um so it, it's i don't recommend taking anything like that unless you talk to your doctor first because it does have a huge Im- impact on a lot of your biological systems yeah i i think i would say that that's good advice in general and you know you know we haven't really talked about sleep drugs or ambient or something but i i think the advice probably is to talk to your doctor or rather than rather than listen to a podcast. <laughs> so, but 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 I know it's tempting, you know, because uh, some 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 people have very serious sleep issues, and some people would just like to feel better. Right, and and, and there's there's another point here because the, one of the the big terms these days, and in, in certainly in the U.S. medical system, is comorbidities. Oh, true. Yeah. Right. So you know, just because you have. You know, people have, and I've worked with not athletes, but I've worked with workers that have diabetes, who are obese, and have sleep apnea. So, you know, your sleep problem might not be one thing; it could be two things or three things. Mm. Yeah, true, and 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 you're right. We've never heard more about the comorbidity issue than than we're hearing right now. So, yeah, and and it all you know, I've also heard like you know, overeating can be a result of lack of sleep. Um, so you know, one thing feeds into all types of of systems. I mean, I mean, we're not a just a just a collection of parts. We're a a whole, right? And that's it. That's what we said in the book. We're not a bunch of jigsaw puzzles. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's where I got that. I stole it from you. We're, no, we're an integrated system, right? And and part of the challenge, in the certainly in the Western world, is that we there are a large large number of uh, medical specialties, 
that look at one part of the body. One looks at the brain, one looks at your eyes, one looks at your heart, one looks at, one looks at your liver. It, but we're an integrated system. And so the great challenge, because sleep is such an integrated system, is to try to pull all these pieces together. And and there's the, the training for sleep medicine specialists is getting a lot better along that way. So a lot of confidence in those guys. Great. That's a good point of advice to stop on. The, the, the book is Inconvenient Sleep, Why Teams Win and Lose. It's by Pat Byrne and Su- Suzanne Byrne. And is that um, available where, where books are sold? Or Absolutely. Usually, I mean, most of it's online um, these days. Anybody, I don't know if at the end yeah, of the book, books are even open. Uh, but yeah, the usual, you know, the usual Amazon, the, any place that you can buy a book online, it's there anywhere in the world. Are you online? Do you have a we do. website? We have, we have, do we have a website? It's um, burn, B-Y-R-N-E dash co dot com. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Pat. I definitely appreciate your time. I feel like I should go take a nap, but <laughs> I've got a few things to do. But 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 I think the good thing is that if I do take a nap, I, I'm not going to feel guilty about it. So, so that's that's a gift you've given us. We have one last thing in our house. Sleep is good. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.